In this video lecture, we're going to be focusing on interpreting the derivative as a rate of change. Now, one of the important applications of the derivative, which involves the motion of an object traveling along a straight line, is what we will use to interpret the derivative as a rate of change. So suppose an object moves along a straight line according to the following equation, s equals to f of t where this equation is actually the position function of the object. Right, so this is the position function, that's what I meant to write. So here where s denotes the position of the object in meters at time t, which qualifies why the input is t, so t denotes time. So working with this position function, we can then write down a formula for average velocity. So recall from what you would have learned in school that velocity can be computed by taking the displacement uh, over time. So average velocity in particular will then be equal to the change in s over the change in t, where the change in t denotes the length of the interval of time with which we have obtained the change in s, which is displacement. So we're looking at the change of position of the object, which denotes displacement. And so this is length of the interval of time. So in particular, if I had to work with the interval given by lower bound t and upper bound t plus delta t, where delta t refers to the change in time, then the average velocity over that interval of time will then be equal to. So just to make a note, average velocity is often denoted by V subscript AVE. So the average velocity, which I've now used in that notation, we know is equal to the change in S, which is displacement, over the change in T, which is looking at that interval of time. So based on this, the change in s we know is given by that function, position function f of t. So this is just going to equal to f evaluated at the upper bound, which is t plus delta t, minus f evaluated at the lower bound of that interval, which is t, divided by the change in t, which is t plus delta t minus t giving me delta t based on that interval. And in particular, if I wanted to obtain the velocity at time t, then this amounts to essentially calculating, take, sorry, taking the limit as delta t approaches zero. Right? For if delta t approaches zero, then observe this interval will then coincide with what's happening at time t. So this amounts to taking the limit of the average velocity, which is the limit as delta t approaches zero of f of t plus delta t minus f of t divided by delta t. So essentially, looking at what we have written here, this should now look familiar to you because this is actually the first principle's definition of a derivative. So now observe that velocity at time t based on this definition simply equals to the derivative of the position function with respect to t. So essentially what we have is that whenever you want to find instantaneous velocity, so velocity at time t is referred to as the, as the instantaneous velocity, then it amounts to simply computing the derivative of your position function and then, of course, evaluating at time t, where you're computing the derivative of the position function with respect to t. So a quick example, this is from your notes. So suppose we have a position function, f of t equals to 3t squared plus 5, right? where t denotes time in seconds, and s equals f of t is denoted in meters. So find the average velocity over that interval. So we have our formula for average velocity over an interval. It is important to take note of what delta t is meaning. What is the length of the interval? We're working with the interval 10 to 10.1. So to 
compute delta t, it amounts to saying 10.1 minus 10, which gives me an answer of 0 0.1. And of course, the lower bound in here is t, as expressed there. So the average velocity, just using exactly the same formula, equals to f evaluated at the upper bound of the interval, which means 10.1, or here I've written it as 10 plus 0 0.1, so f evaluated at 10 plus 0 0.1, minus f evaluated at the lower bound of the interval, which is 10, and here that is f of 10, divided by delta t, and delta t is 0 0.1, and that has been substituted into the denominator. Of course, we know that f of t is 3t squared plus 5, so substituting in 10.1 into that function gives you 311.03. Substituting 10 into that function gives you a value of 305. Denominator is unchanged. And putting this into your calculator, you get out a final answer of 60.3. But of course, we interpret this as meters per second. So the average velocity of the object moving along, in this case, the number line, over this time interval is 60.3 meters per second. If you want to find the velocity at a specific time, this is instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity. And so, as we had seen on the previous slide, instantaneous velocity is simply equal to the derivative of the position function with respect to t. So we have the position function, take its derivative with respect to t, that's the derivative with respect to t of 3t squared plus 5. Derivative of 3t squared is 6t, derivative of 5 is 0, which is why I have not written it down there. So if we want to evaluate what's happening at t equals to 10, it amounts to simply substituting 10 into that velocity formula, and so we see that velocity when t is 10 is 60 meters per second. Now, in general, given a function, we can then observe that the rate of change um, in relation to this derivation, because we've seen that velocity at time t is actually equal to the derivative, and this is um, with respect to that a rate of change. So in here, given any function y equals to f of x, delta y over delta x given by that formula, which once again is analogous to what I've written down here. All I've done is transferred and rewritten this in terms of x rather than input variable t. And observe that this formula is essentially just giving me the average velocity, sorry, the average rate of change. So previously we worked with velocity but now we're working with the rate of change and this is the average rate of change over the interval x comma x plus delta x. And in here dy dx which is obtained by taking the limit of that average rate of change is essentially the instantaneous rate of change with respect to x. And we refer to the instantaneous rate of change as just the rate of change. So if you read through your textbook, you will see that, that is how it is mentioned. Now before we end, I just want to bring your attention to some applications in economics. So let's suppose I had given you the cost function, the total cost function um, for the production and the marketing of Q units. So the input in here is Q, which is quantity. So this is the total cost function. Then looking at some applications using our derivative, the rate of change of the cost function, meaning of C, with respect to Q is called the marginal cost. So we then obtain the marginal cost function. And since this is the rate of change of C with respect to Q, as you would expect, this amounts to just taking the derivative 
of the total cost function, which means we are simply computing the derivative of C with respect to Q. In addition, you might find it um, necessary to note the following, that if you were given a total cost function, then you could then compute the average cost per unit, which we denote by C bar, as follows. So C bar is equal to your total cost function divided by Q, where Q denotes quantity. So this was with respect to cost. We also have a similar um, section uh, pertaining to revenue. So suppose that I had given you a total revenue function, F of Q. Right, so this depends on the quantity that is sold. So then the rate of change of the total amount of money is received based on sales with respect to the total number of units sold is then called the marginal revenue function. And once again, since it is the rate of change of the total amount of money is received uh, with respect to quantity sold, this, as you would expect, is just equal to R prime, the derivative of the revenue function. And just to put it down more explicitly, this just amounts to saying take the derivative of R with respect to Q. So some quick applications. So let's suppose we were given the average cost function. So C bar is average cost function. Right. We want to find the marginal cost function. Now, whenever you see the word marginal, I would essentially like for you to think of the word derivative. So every time you see marginal, think derivative. Think derivative. So marginal cost function means derivative of the cost function. Marginal revenue function means derivative of the revenue function. So here, if we want the marginal cost function, it means I need to take the derivative of the cost function. So I need to know what is the total cost function. What is the total cost function, which we call C. We've been given average cost function. So that means in order to compute C, I then need to take the average cost function and multiply it to Q. So that amounts to doing the following, taking 0.00. .00 Zero 01 q squared minus 0 0.02 q plus 5 plus 5000 divided by q times q. So multiplying that, distributing that in, it's 0 0.0001 q cubed minus 0 0.02 q squared plus 5 q plus 5000. So this is the total cost function. If I want the marginal cost function, then I need to compute the derivative of the cost function. And what is the derivative of the cost function? 3 times that constant, which is 0.003q squared. So I have decreased the exponent by 1. Looking at the second term, 2 multiplied to 0.02, which makes it 0.04. There's a negative that's been preserved, times q raised to the power 1. Derivative of 5 times q is positive 5. Derivative of a constant of 5,000 is 0. So this is the marginal cost function.